Is volume fine? Cool. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope you all had like a nice uh, tea break. And uh, today I am going to talk about a little bit about the challenges that I faced during my tenure uh, with the Kubernetes release team and what I learned from those challenges. How did I tackle them? And what were the learnings from doing like 10 releases over the course of the past three years? Who am I? Uh, I maintain some areas of the Kubernetes code base. I am uh, maintaining the Kubernetes release engineering subproject. Uh, I contribute to uh, other code areas like API machinery, auth, uh, CLI, and also take care of uh, contributor experience of the Kubernetes community. Um, besides that, uh, I work at VMware as a senior engineer. Um, my role there is mostly to do open source. Um, I work on the Kubernetes project at VMware uh, and encourage people even from the company to contribute to code bases that we use and give back to the community. Um, besides that, in my free time, I sp I've been spending the last two years uh, being the technical lead of uh, PyCon India. Um, the website is down right now. That is due to SSL, and we'll fix it. Um, I know people will have that question. Um, moving over. Uh, so the main topic of the talk. So the talk is going to have like four pieces. Uh, two pieces talking about what a Kubernetes release constitutes, and then talking about the challenges and the learnings from them. Um, the first and foremost and very important part of the puzzle is the people who drive the process, people who drive the release team, people who be part of the release team. So we have almost uh, 40 people uh, with one lead uh, leading the team. Um, every release cycle, every four months, we constitute a team of 40 people. Some of those people are rolling from the previous release team, and some people come as new contributors. We try to keep a mix of uh, people from various backgrounds, from various experience levels, so that we have like optimum uh, knowledge transfer and how do we gain experiences uh, from those people's experiences. And in the end, mentor people who are called shadows, or uh, in traditional sense, they're kind of apprentices or, or interns. We try to train them and become the leads in the next cycle. Uh, even in the cohort right now, amongst the audience, we have a few people who have contributed to the release team before. I'll tell you a little bit about um, what each of these teams mean. Um, on the leftmost, we have someone called Emeritus Advisor. The person is mostly a previous release lead who knows ins and outs about the release and how do you mentor the release lead in any questions that arises. So you can think of uh, the person to be an advisor in the board. Um, then we have the release lead and his or her team or their team of uh, shadows. So the release lead, you can speak of them as like managers of a uh, large project. They work in the intersections of uh, engineering management and technical lead. Um, and they have to ensure that everything which is happening in the release is followed to the T and all of the processes are done and the quality of the release is maintained. And they do so with the help of the other six team leads and their team of shadows. Enhancements, take care of feature collection, ensure that all features have uh, tests written, all features uh, have their uh, review process done properly, there, there are approvals from the area code owners. There's a CI signal team. Uh, it just basically means that you have to ensure the quality of the release. We will see in a future slide how do we ensure everything is passing and uh, how do you see them in a gist. Bug triage, uh, this is the team which uh, crunches through almost like thousand-ish issues that get filed every release on the Kubernetes repository. And I'm just talking about the main Kubernetes repository. A few months back, we crossed like 100K issues and PRs on that repo. Uh, which itself says like how much churn is there in terms of like features, bugs, and what we fix. And this team maintains and manages and uh, triages those things. Docs, uh, they are very important part because once you write the features, you need to have docs for the consumers to actually consume those newly written features. Release notes, um, change logs might seem very trivial uh, in the start. But there are several parts of the change log, right? What features have you added? What is the criticality of those features? Are these major changes? Are these breaking changes? 
uh, what kind of dependencies we changed, did we upgrade a Go version in the release. This kind of questions are answered in the release notes and hence we need a team who uses a tooling which goes through all of the pull requests filed in a specific duration and then manually verifies them whether the tooling has done some sane job or not. And the comms team maintains the release blogs, uh, ensures that all of the major features that have gone into the release have an associated feature blog if they wish to do so. Uh, people who are cluster administrators or infrastructure engineers in their companies might know that we deprecated uh, the Docker runtime. We essentially did not deprecate Docker runtime, but we deprecated a part of our code base which communicated with Docker runtime. Now we don't support that feature anymore, it's just like out of tree support. But a team like comms has to maintain a healthy interaction with the community through feature blogs to ensure that such changes are communicated well. Now, what about the process? We talked about the people. Uh, and in addition to those six teams, we have one more team which actually maintains this process and releases Kubernetes or cut, cuts releases. Um, this is a little pixelated, but when I share the slides with the PDF, uh, you could get the flow. This is just a, a flow chart which explains like at the start of the release cycle till the release day, which teams get involved in what parts. But broadly I'll give you a, a hundred feet overview because we are not concerned too much about the intricacies here, we want to learn about the challenges and learnings. So what happens is at the start, uh, the enhancements team asks the community like, hey, what features do you want to be included in this release? And those features get tracked in a certain fashion. We use GitHub issues for this. In a specific repository is there for enhancements. Uh, taking inspiration from Python enhancement proposals, we named our process Kubernetes enhancement proposals or short term disk caps. So when these caps come in, there is a period of collection and then once these are collected and even before these are collected, people can start working on those features. And the second phase starts where people code, write tests, write integration tests and if needed they will write E2E tests as well. Those get written and we reach code freeze where we freeze the code base, we freeze the main branch. Once we freeze the main branch, we have ample time to see our CI quality and then determine whether we need to write more tests or fix some tests. And during this period until test freeze, we do this thing. Test phase is usually like one or two weeks before the release. So once we have enough confidence about uh, our tests, the code, we proceed on to like docs, uh, comms, and then at the end, we just cut the tag at the end of the release uh, cycle. That all happens. Now remember I talked about how do we ensure CI quality. So we have this thing called test grid. This basically has a lot of dashboards grouped into uh, certain tests, for example, we are seeing here master blocking tests. What this essentially means is, if anything fails here, for example, you can see uh, probably the text is not legible, but it's a conformance test. So we can see a red block. So the conformance test has been failing. In such cases, we block the release. Hence the name master blocking. So if you can't, if you don't have confidence the tests are passing, we essentially don't release. Or it may be some failure like getting the cluster up, which in which case it may be a trivial fix, we try to verify it and we may proceed. But master blocking and the release branch blocking job should actually be green. After we ensure that the quality is there, we use a tooling called CREL. Uh, this is essentially the Kubernetes release toolbox. Th at least two or three years back, uh, all the releases and the processes were done using an elaborate scheme of bash scripts, but we all know how hard is it to debug or write bash for new people. Uh, so the community started to port all of the release tooling code base to Go and essentially we came with this thing called CREL. What CREL does for you is build the code in Google Cloud Build, generate the binaries, generate any container images required using uh, the manifests on all platforms that we support for each component that is released. What do I mean by component? kubectl, uh, the Kubernetes API server, the Kubernetes controller manager, and a lot of other images like we have a conformance image as well. So these are all built for platforms that we support. 
in addition we build binaries and then once all of this happened we sign those images and push them to the OCI registry whichever we use. Currently we use GCR with support coming from uh, AWS to host local registries in their data center so that we save costs, we as in the community. Uh, once they are pushed to the staging registries, so we have this process called staging. So once this process gets done, we stage all these artifacts to a particular place called staging registry and staging buckets. Now we need to promote them to production. Why this is needed is because we kind of are doing a sanity check whether things are running fine or not. Once the packages are built, the uh, container images are built, we promote them using a tooling called kpromo. So kpromo used to be folded into the release tooling, but we made it generic enough so that other projects in the Kubernetes ecosystem, for example, cluster API or other things not related to the Kubernetes code base, but following the specification of uh, staging and production registries can use this tooling. So if anyone of you want follow that ideology of staging images and then promoting them to your registries, you can look at kpromo. This also verifies the staged signed images and then generates new signature, new production signatures for them. Now, after all of this is done, we hand off the process to a specific team at Google who does uh, the DBN and RPM packaging for us. The reason that is still under Google is because of the GPG keys. Currently, the community is exploring avenues on how we can manage our own keys and move to a community built infrastructure. That is going to happen in probably one or two release cycles, maybe by December or next March. Now, once we have uh, the Debian and RPM packages pushed to the respective registries, we can just release Kubernetes and we announce the release. Uh, the change log is generated, the tag is cut all by CREL and then we are done. Okay. Uh, Cadence, uh, we used to do uh, three Kubernetes, four Kubernetes releases per year till 2019. Now we do three, mostly because uh, consumers complained that you, you're doing too, much release, too many releases that we can consume and catch up to since we only support like uh, single version change upgrades. We don't support like uh, multi-version upgrades. You can upgrade from 1.x to 1.x plus 2. Um, support. Uh, we support Kubernetes for around 12 months. Standard support, we will release patch releases every month. Uh, whatever features come in, whatever uh, CV fixes come in. If there is a very critical CV fix, we can do an emergency release as well. Uh, we have a process for that. If you, want, if you want to know about this process, we can talk like async, but this is out of the scope. Uh, after standard support is done, we do two months of maintenance releases and this is only CV fixes. Uh, we don't maintain uh, features anymore. If there are any bugs, uh, not very critical bugs, we don't maintain it. Since uh, we have less time, I'll just go over the points on challenges and learnings now. Distributed team. Uh, per, we have a highly distributed team from several countries, 40 people. At least in 1.21, which I led, we had, I had people from like one UTC plus eight to UTC minus eight, starting from Taiwan to San Francisco. And that poses a lot of challenge, like communication. We'll see how we can solve that. Uh, another issue is large code base. Probably one of the largest code base, I don't know if it is the second largest or what, I, I, I don't have metrics on that. But that poses a lot of challenges because we also have a lot of components which have to be built for a lot of platforms at the same time. And the consumables are also high, uh, binaries, container images, uh, Go packages that you can import and build on top of Kubernetes. We have a separate mechanism for that as well. Kubernetes is a monolith, so you can't import Kubernetes slash Kubernetes. We have a different way of importing specific packages. That is again a separate uh, topic in itself. Now, quality. So, since we deliver a lot of consumables and to a lot of downstream consumers, there are distribution vendors, there are people who just use Kubernetes for hobby, they expect a certain level of quality. We have had major challenges in the past, for example, even because of dependencies. We depend on Go. Go had a problem with 1.18 that they had to fix emergently because of us. We found it, but our release also needed to be two weeks delayed. And that is kind of not acceptable in like absolute terms, but when things are not in our control, we have to uh, delay. Which also brings me to my point of timeline. We have to follow a very strict timeline. 
primarily because of the reason that thousands and thousands of consumers depend on us and a majority of the current infrastructure uh, providers use Kubernetes as an underlying platform to build their services on top. And hence the need for a very strict timeline because they depend on us releasing on time for their products. The issue I mentioned earlier delayed us by two weeks, but it is very rare. We rarely delay releases. And the classic problem of any open source uh, projects, we don't have enough contributors. We have a lot of contributors who are coming in new uh, to the community, but we really lack contributors who are experienced and who can mentor these new people to grow and replace them themselves. If you want to uh, show up, like just talk to me later, I'll tell you like how you can get started and uh, be a mentor uh, really soon. Learnings, over communicate. Uh, when you think you have done enough public communication, I would say really think twice. The point may not have been taken well or because communication is two parts, saying and listening. You have to ensure that communication is done well. And communicate asynchronously. When you have such large time differences, 16 hours of time span, you really can't have video meetings. You can't have meetings on Zoom to decide on something. In such scenarios, try to communicate asynchronously using methods like mailing lists. If your community uses Slack, Kubernetes uses Slack, so use Slack a lot. And when you communicate asynchronously, you can't take decisions on the go. You can't take, let's say, hey, I want to uh, shift my release by two weeks. Can we do so? Can we take the decision in five minutes? Not really. You have to, you have to follow uh, lazy consensus. What I mean by lazy consensus is consensus building over a defined time frame. For example, we give people three days. Hey, we are planning to delay Kubernetes releases by two weeks. Who has problem? Do people agree that we can do it? And this is what I mean by lazy consensus. Ensure discipline. Again, coming to the point of timeline, quality. No, nothing much to say about it. Now, this is one of the mantras that I have been following uh, since the time in my release team. Do, delegate, and defer. As a leader, you have to know, because your time is limited, you have to know what tasks you can do yourself right now you can delegate to your team, your shadows or the other leads and the things that you can defer to a later time frame. Making this decision is, an utmost, is of utmost importance because this decides the nature of the release that you are doing. Take this advice very carefully because it is applicable to any project, be it open source, be it inside your company, be it a closed source project or any decision that you take in life. And with that, how can you help? Come join us in Kubernetes SIG release. SIG is just a special interest group, just a way to segregate our community by code base ownership. Uh, we are right now working on uh, software supply chain security and ensuring the Debian and RPM packages are built in community infra. So if you would like to help in such areas, come talk to me. I'll patch you in with people who are working on those areas. And you can get started with Kubernetes uh, contributions. You can join the mailing list. Uh, I, this, will, this will all be links in the uh, slide deck. And you can join our Slack. You can join using slack.kters.io. And that's all. Thank you. Um, I think we do have one or two questions. Okay. So any questions? Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just had uh, like a couple of questions, right? So one thing you had mentioned was that uh, you try to stick to a very, very strict release timeline because, you know, you have a lot of downstream consumers globally. Um, so uh, from that perspective, like how do you make the decision to, you know, evidently you'll have to cut features at some point of time and go like, okay, uh, these are not going to go in this release because we don't have the time to complete development on this or, you know, there's some bugs or something we found in the last minute. So uh, how do you sort of decide which features go in and which don't? Uh, that's one question. And the second thing that I had was like, uh, you mentioned that uh, you have like lazy consensus around uh, decisions that, you know, uh, you have like a global team on which you guys work with. 
So lots of time zone differences because I deal with a similar thing at work as well. And one of the things that tends to happen is that decisions tend to be taken usually by, you know, you escalate it a little bit and then somebody takes a decision at one point uh, rather than have that decision kind of, you know, spread globally because what tends to happen is it takes a much longer time to make those decisions, right? So uh, how do you kind of keep that in mind? Like um, when you're trying to like, is there like a cutoff time that you have for like, okay, we will make a decision within a week or something like that if, if we aren't able to arrive at, you know, we, we lean towards this unless there are like opposition views. Like how do you, how do you handle that? Right. Cool. So there are primarily two questions here. Keep me honest, like if I say something. Um, so the first question was how do we decide on what features go in and how do you cut and say that, okay, this feature won't go in. So this is the first question. And the second question is how do we determine the lazy consensus period and how do we determine when to cut off that decision? Yep, right? exactly. Yeah. Uh, so on the first question, uh, the way we do it is, so since the community is divided across various special interest groups and every special interest group has a set of approvers. So when the features come in, the release team just wrangles those features, but keeps the delegation to those six to decide whether the features can be completed or not. And if a major chunk of the feature has been completed, but minor things are left, we have a process called exceptions. So we give like two or three days grace for people to complete. If they are not completed, we revert back the changes. If the changes are very intrusive, if they are not consumer facing, we ideally don't revert because mm -hmm. they won't affect the quality of the project. Mm -hmm. Coming to the second question, decision of lazy consensus, sometimes we have written policies that we will follow n days of lazy consensus. Mm -hmm. For far community wide decisions, we may have 14 days. For shorter problems, we may have 2 to 3 days. But sometimes where the policy is not defined, we kind of let the leads decide in consultation with the SIG release leads, because this is a group inside SIG release, the release team. And SIG release will have some leads and they are like far more experts because they have been here for like four or five years. So we kind of consult with them that, hey, we are going to ask the community for three, four days of lazy consensus, is it fine? When in doubt, we ask questions. That's where I say like over communicate, that right. it's better to ask for opinions from more people in a short period of time, as much as you can but not block because you can't block on people. That's why you say like only three days, 72 hours, you have to read this email and answer. Mm -hmm. So that's how we handle it. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Hey, I'm Dave. Thank you so Hi. much for the talk. It's really helpful. Uh, I'm curious about your testing methodology. Like, uh, do you ha ever have a point where, uh, you know, you you, you want to test something that's very hard to test uh, using code. So do you have any manual testing or anything like that? Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure there are cases where yeah. like, you know, you have to sort of uh, test like these five things together. And, you know, there's cases, there's always uh, cases where it's very hard mm -hmm. to test using a, using code. And, you know, th there's certainly some expertise in when yeah. humans do it. Yeah. So, so the question is, in cases where we can't really write smaller unit of tests or where it involves like large number of components, let's say five components, how do you handle that scenario? So Kubernetes has a tiered testing methodology, like unit tests have to be written along with the code. Uh, then we have integration tests, then we have E2E tests, then at the end we have conformance. So when I showed you the test failing, right? Conformance is a set of end-to-end -end tests involving one or more components, which ensure that some functionality of Kubernetes is intact. For example, let's say if I, if I say, hey, Kubernetes, I want to run one deployment with Nginx and the port 80 exposed. How many components does it involve? API server, kubectl, kubeproxy, uh, and whoever is like proxying the traffic, right? So you write E2E testing scenarios for those, scenari for those cases where you can test with like single unit of code. And we have frameworks developed specifically for Kubernetes. And uh, primarily those frameworks use Gingo and Gomega as underlying libraries to run this uh, scenarios. And this is what we test usually. So the SIG release usually doesn't uh, test for unit tests or where integrity tests are written. We ideally look at the health of the whole project, like conformance is passing or not, uh, integration tests are passing or not. That's what we look at. Do have time for one more? Or any questions? Maybe we'll take the last and then we'll move on to hallway. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> again, uh, cool talk. Thank you so much. 
uh, just wanted to uh, elaborate. I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about uh, your large scale testing. So <clears throat> you mentioned that there are specific frameworks that you folks use. So could you just shed a little bit more light on whether or not these are available for public use or uh, what the scenario, how do you orchestrate tests at that point and can you use them to orchestrate more deployments than tests? Um, so the question is, in, in a large scale testing scenario, how do we maintain those tests and are, are the frameworks that I talked about in the last question public? Uh, yes, and all of the frameworks that we write are in the Kubernetes slash the core repository, and anyone can use them. Anyone so and then we are making it pluggable as well. We call it like kubetest two, um, where we are writing a uh, deployer kind of setting where you can like deploy different kinds of deploy different kinds of cloud providers for tests that you want to run. Um, for large scale testing, we just probably use Bash, right, like to spin up like huge number of clusters. Sounds cool. Yeah. Thank you. And Gingo and Omega also give like uh, handles to like th these are just scenario testings. So you can write code which will spin up clusters like thousands of them later on. These are all pluggable. Right. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming to this talk. Um, I, I am in the hallway anywhere for questions. Feel free to ask me anything about Kubernetes releases or any part of Kubernetes. Um, I'll be there. Thank you all.